I bought the mirror from my stepfather, who had inherited it from his stepfather. He claimed he didn't like it, but after the experiences I've had with it, I believe now he did what he could to get rid of it. At the time, it was a rather large investment for a young English teacher, having followed in my father's footsteps. The mirror was ornamental, a seemingly Asian design, and gorgeously stained a deep red mahogany. It had spirals ascending on either side, beginning from the bottom and intertwining like a caduceus. At the apex of each spiral was some sort of shellfish, either an ornate clam or smooth mollusk. On the rear, it has a small etched logo, a simple MI. Otherwise, there are no marks, chips, or cracks in the wood or glass. It appears to be very old, but in a way looks like it was made only recently, carefully, with an expert hand. It barely fit into my wife's town car, but we managed to load it and keep it mar-free in the massive truck. When I mounted it on the wall in our living room, I placed it across from another, more modern mirror, creating an infinity effect. Unfortunately, I failed to attach our hanger to a stud in the wall, and after only a few minutes, the nail ripped out of the wall and crashed on the floor. My wife and daughter heard it fall and claimed that it made the telltale tingling of glass fracturing after a thudded impact. When I came into the room and found it lying face down, I turned it over, preparing for the worst. I feared the $6,000 I invested in was now trash. But as I lifted it, I found it was perfectly intact. My wife, 37, and my daughter, now 11, have always been credible, other than flirtatious white lies from the wife and giggle fibs from my little girl. I didn't doubt their claims about the noise it made, Yet showing them the evidence, they both appeared dumbfounded at it and glanced awkwardly at one another. I purchased the correct anchors and brackets to really secure the mirror and installed it the next morning. I added an even more secure joint, not wanting it to ever fail again. When I hung it on the wall and peered into it, I found the reflection of the first infinite wave from the opposite mirror, but it had changed. What before was an infinity effect was now the old mirror and the reflection of my modern mirror, showing a glorious mosaic of fractured cracks. I spun my head around and inspected the mirror I just hung, and it was still blemish-free. I called out to my wife, and as she arrived, I told her to look at the mirror. She looked, looked at the modern one, and quickly glanced back just as I did, confirming my experience. She stared at me, slack-jawed, when my daughter entered the room. She asked what we were looking at, and when we tried to show her, she couldn't see the reflected cracks. Scratching our heads, we simply dismayed it and headed out to the ice cream shop. I would find out later that the red flag of refracted cracks should have prompted me to remove it. No one but my wife and I saw the cracked mirror. We would entertain occasional guests and friends. Family would visit and no one noticed anything odd. No one announced any odd feelings felt from it. Even in my immediate group, and often we receive compliments on its beauty and condition. A year and seven months passed, when one day, I noticed a slightly askew view in the perception of the modern mirror. I happened to walk past the old mirror, and casually glanced into it. I saw myself in the reflection, but my head was turned a slightly different direction. I stopped my trot, spun around, and stood directly in front of the old mirror and stared at my own face, cautiously, momentarily. I watched as my face, no, my head, turned slowly to the left, not breaking contact with my own eyes. My daughter walked into the room from the left just a second after my head in the mirror turned and I realized that I too turned my head just as the mirror did. Neither my refracted doppelganger nor myself broke eye contact. I thought to myself about those comedic moments in cartoons where a person meets his twin, convinced it's a mirror, and starts doing silly things to test it. Sometimes it's a mirror, sometimes it's a twin. 
just as I remembered the Marx Brothers' famous duck soup mirror scene in which Harpo pretends to be Groucho's reflection. The twin in my mirror raised his hand and waved at me. I gasped. I startled back a step and stared intently at the waving hand. It seemed like me. It moved like mine, even sharing the same scar as mine from when I had cut it with a carving knife one unfortunate Thanksgiving ago. I realized then that as I was looking at its wave, I was waving too, my hand feeling alien. It seemed to be that whatever it did in the mirror, only seconds later I would copy it. It felt like an echo delay. I was instantly uncomfortable, and I quickly left the room and found my wife. We conversed about it, and she agreed that she had noticed something peculiar herself, such as noticing a piece of furniture was moved in the mirror but not in the room. She'd return later to see the room rearranged to mimic the mirror. She originally assumed her daughter had done it. Later, she noticed in the reflection a book on a table, but again, not in the room. She found that same book on her nightstand that evening. The book was the first Harry Potter book, one of her favorites. She found that the chapter which featured Harry sitting with the magic mirror and his dead parents was immarked. An obvious omen, but overlooked as a coincidence. Her repeated mantra was, it feels like a bad dream, every time she commented on her odd situation. We decided then and there that it was time to take it down. I'd sell it, probably for a fraction of my investment, or cover and store it. We headed downstairs and found our daughter talking to the mirror, to herself. Our interruption disturbed her. We asked who she was talking to. She simply said, Myself, duh, and hopped away. My wife and I heaved the thing off the clevis joint I made and it set it down. As I turned to grab a hold of it from behind, I looked straight onto the modern mirror and saw an oddness. The reflection showed the mirror still in place, still cracked, still hanging on the wall. At the base of it was my daughter, lying still in a pool of blood. I remained fixated on the scene, unable to turn away. I was standing in the spot that the mirror showed my dead or dying daughter. For a brief moment, the scene changed to my wife and I having sex in the blood puddle. The lovemaking session evolved until the two of us, covered in blood, merged into one hideously large woman. She grabbed at her thigh, ripping flesh off, and daintily placed it into her mouth. As she consumed herself, she morphed into my daughter. I looked closer, getting tunnel vision, and I strained to see the faintest of movement from her body. That's when I noticed an angled reflection in the blood. A face. My face. My face stared back at me from the puddle. Once I made eye contact with it, it started to rise up out of the puddle, taking a crimson form as its volume and mass increased. The body of my daughter seemed to wisp away, as if an invisible vacuum was sucking her inside itself. As my copied, bloodied form emerged, my daughter steadily grew smaller. My wife grabbed my arm and shook me, pulling me out of my hypnotic trance I was in. I stole a look at her, then right back to the mirror on the other wall. All was back as it should have been. I saw myself, bracing the mirror against my bosom, my wife adjacent staring deeply at me, and my daughter standing to the other side of me. I looked away from my wife and glanced at my girl, but she wasn't there. Back in the mirror, she wasn't either, seemingly disappearing from both realities. I wasn't quite sure what I had seen, and so I buried the ideation into the farthest recesses of my mind. Later that evening, we watched a newer romance on VHS, cuddling on the couch. During the scene in which Tom Hanks reaches the top of the Empire State Building and runs into Meg Ryan, curing his sleeplessness, the screen faded darkly for just a second, and in that second, I saw a bloodied me standing over my shoulder pointing me directly through the screen. I convulsed slightly, startling my wife. 
She accused me of falling asleep during her favorite part, but I know what I saw. As we cleaned up the popcorn in our empty chip mugs, the news was blaring about some incident with a woman in a bus. I took care not to look at its empty space where the clevis joint and other hardware still hung. Instead, I tilted my head to my left as I passed, and in my peripheral vision, I saw myself walk past the modern mirror. As soon as I crossed my own path, my reflection abruptly changed course and charged at me. I turned my head to fully grasp the vision, and I realized that the running me was coming from the reflection of the old mirror still hanging. As I turned back to look at the blank wall, I was struck hard from behind, plowed down like a defensive tackle sacking a lazy quarterback. The shock of the hit knocked the wind out of me, and the two of us toppled to the ground. I rolled onto my back and started to wrestle my attacker. As I reached with my searching fingers for a hold, I realized I was fighting my bloodied self. He straddled me, smacking my hands away, and at once grabbed my throat with both hands and squeezed. We locked eyes, and I felt a withering sensation overcome my entirety. I choked the life out of him. It was so easy. He was so scared. He had no idea what was happening, only that I was there, killing him, and he was defenseless. He tried to grab at me, pull my hands away, but he kept slipping off, unable to grasp the slick blood that coated my body. He tried hard, and after three minutes of desperation, he finally went limp. Not dead, just unconscious. I picked him up over my shoulder and carried him into the mirror. I washed the blood off of me, put on his clothes, and stepped out of the mirror into the completely ignorant bliss of his wife and daughter. Later he awoke, as I had once done, and he slammed against the mirror, glaring at me, screaming at me. I simply mouthed to him, Don't wait for me. Occasionally, I will see him at the mirror, trying to break the mimic he's forced to repeat. I will bring his wife to the mirror, the modern one as he called it, and show her off to him. Of course she can't see that it's him. She can't see the ancient mirror still hanging on the other wall. Sometimes, when that girl of his is out of the house, I will make love to his wife in front of him. I do it where he can see it, but doesn't have to mimic it since it's just out of perception. I can hear his desperate banging on the mirror as he gets furious at me, but she can't hear it. Hopefully, his wife I have impregnated will birth me a son, one which I can sell the mirror to. Or maybe I'll help the daughter find a soother worthy of imprisonment in the mirror, so her real father can escape. Either way, he's throwing his life away on the other side of the mirror, instead of living it the way he could. Unfortunately, he is stuck in the infinity he created, and with his wife, my wife, sold the mirror to an avid mirror collector from the Pine Grove Mall, it meant only his easy escape from my trap departed with it. He can only escape to a son-in-law or stepson. I wonder what evil entity will trap that mirror collector. There are so many that can be trapped inside. I wonder how many will be trapped in that hall of mirrors the collector owns. I wonder how many mirrors he has sold with trapped innocence contained within. Desperate, trying to mimic him well enough to steal his soul and escape their imprisonment. After all, when I escaped, it was 1993. I had been trapped 80 years. A lot of mirrors have been made, bought, sold, and resold in the last two and a half decades. I wonder where he is now. Maybe best not to look too close at your mirrors.